Hello, this is Chris Safarova. Welcome to another episode of the Strategy Skills Podcast. And before we start today's interview, I have a free download for you. If you want to strengthen your strategy skills, get the overall approach used in well-managed strategy studies. Go to firmsconsulting.com forward slash overall approach. So it is F-I-R-M-S consulting.com forward slash overall approach. And today we have with us Thomas Curran. Thomas is a professor of psychology at the London School of Economics. His TED talk on perfectionism has received more than 3 million views. And uh, his research has been featured in media, including HBR, CNN, and he's the author of The Perfection Trap. Welcome, Thomas. So great to have you with us today. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thomas, so what perfectionism really is? Maybe let's start there, because I think we need some definition before we start this discussion. Absolutely. So perfectionism is a personality characteristic that contains two main things. The first is a intense need to be perfect and nothing but perfect. So it contains a lot of striving, a lot of overwork uh, for excessively high goals in combination with quite harsh and scathing self-criticism uh, when we haven't met those goals. And those are the two core components of perfectionism. And if you identify with one or both of those and it's likely you'll have a little bit of perfectionism in yourself and are there different types of perfectionism maybe something like self-imposed socially imposed something like that yeah there's all sorts of different types of perfectionism so we've done many many years of research now trying to understand what perfectionism is and what it does to us and across those endeavors we've identified that perfectionism isn't just a something that comes from within so high self-set desire and need to be perfect and nothing but perfect but uh perfectionistic people also experience and perceive that people around them expect them to be perfect so not only do i expect to be perfect but other people expect them to be perfect too this is socially prescribed perfectionism where essentially we feel like the world around us is excessively demanding and people are watching and judging us but also perfectionism is turned outwards onto other people too. So not only do we have high self-set and desires to be perfect, but also those needs are, ex- are projected outwards onto other people so that I expect you to be perfect and nothing but perfect. And if you haven't been perfect, then I'm going to let you know. That's called other-oriented perfectionism. So these three types, self-oriented coming from within, socially described coming from the outside, and other-oriented perfectionism turned outwards onto other people, uh, are a broad sort of multi-dimensional perfectionism model. And those are the three uh, core characteristics of perfectionism. Thomas and Maybe let's step a little bit back and talk about what made you so interested in perfectionism to dedicate so much time to it? I myself am a perfectionist and I've been carrying perfectionism around for many, many years. When you work in very competitive environments, when you come through an academic system, which can be quite brutal at times, uh, you tend to lean on perfectionism quite a lot because you feel like it's the one thing that's holding you up. It's the kind of cloak of maximization hyper competence and all the rest of it that you think is making you more successful and to a certain degree that's true but uh, it's not a sustainable way to be successful and i found myself burning out uh having significant mental health problems and once i became aware that those problems are rooted in the perfectionism so rather than helping me it's actually hindering me that was when i began to look a little bit deeper at this personality trait wanted to understand more uh, and so so began my career looking at this curious trait. And from the time you started studying it, if we compare it to now, do you feel you completely got rid of it? Or to some degree, what would be your evaluation? I don't think you ever fully get rid of perfectionism. Perfectionism is is always going to be around and i think it's going to be in every single one of us to a certain degree perfectionism by the way is a spectrum so it doesn't you know there wouldn't we're not you're a perfectionist and i'm not a perfectionist or uh, we don't think in those kind of black and white terms as scientists we see perfection as a spectrum some people will be a lot higher on the spectrum some people will be a lot lower some people will be well, most people will be more or less in the middle around the average around in between and you can begin to manage your perfections in ways that move you down on that spectrum that's to say you kind of manage and mitigate some of the 
worst excesses of the, the of perfectionism but i don't think you ever kind of fully get rid of it you'll always worry about not being perfect things not being quite right you'll always worry about not being good enough but i think you can identify the issues with that type of thinking and put in place practical steps to um reframe um to be kind instead of uh self-critical uh, and to strive perhaps for more healthy um outcomes such as the process of learning you know things like conscientiousness being diligent these are great things um and they're way healthier than perfectionism so you can put in place some steps but you don't necessarily get rid of it totally what do you feel was the defining moment for you when you really made the shift towards healthier relationship with how you see the standards you're pursuing and so on i think when i was brought to the realization that perfectionism was the thing that was holding me back um it's hard to come to that realization because people cling on to their perfectionism so tightly they believe it really is what's pushing them forward and propelling them and and holding them up in the world and i certainly believe that too but over a number of months i was able to see uh that actually no pushing myself to the nth degree worrying about how I'm appearing and performing relative to others and constantly trying to keep going through what are significant moments of stress and distress and really things that are very unhealthy. Um, And that was a turning point for me to be able to take a step back and realize that if I constantly try and happen in the world, I'm going to be miserable. And if I let life happen a little bit more, if I let life in, um, if I let mistakes happen, if I let setbacks occur, if I let the world around me spin on its axis in ways that i just cannot control um you tend to be a lot happier you feel more purpose and you can ride the peaks and troughs uh, a lot easier um and with a lot more of a level head than you can if you're constantly striving to be perfect so i think that was a turning point for me thomas and you did a ted talk and that talk requires uh, using specific script and making it perfect as you're delivering it. So was it a test for you? And in terms of your relationship with perfectionism, what was your experience like? Yeah, the experience was really terrifying for a perfectionist, but I'll take a step back and all the, these talks look perfect, but the reality is what happens behind the curtain is that actually many of the talks have imperfections, have pauses, have moments where people forget their lines. This happens all the time. And it's important people know that actually, because what is presented to us isn't always the reality. And that's very true of society and culture more, more generally. We airbrush, we tinker, we iterate, we put things out into the world that are very shiny and look pristine. But the process going on behind them isn't always the case. And that's the same with us as individuals too. You know, the, what we put out on the surface isn't always the case is what's going on underneath. And that's important to say. However, what I will say about the talk experience itself is, well, you know, it is te- terrifying and there, and you do feel the need to be perfect uh, and you can do all the preparation that you want to do. And I did so much pre- preparation with speech writers and getting the, getting the talk absolutely right, getting the time and getting the pitch right. And then as you stand on that stage, all of that goes from your mind. And the only thing you really think about is getting to the end. <laughs> And that was very much my experience. So it wasn't the most uh, charismatic performance, but no, none of my presentations are very charismatic because as perfectionists, I just overthink it to the point at which it can be a little kill a little bit of the creativity of it. But nevertheless, I got through and I didn't screw up and I didn't capitulate. And that was for me the bigger goal. So when I was at the end, I felt relieved. I felt relieved that I didn't screw up. I wasn't really satisfied that, that, that I got through or didn't feel that any sense of success. I can look back now and and feel like that was a successful moment but at the time you're just so relieved that it didn't go it didn't go badly and by the way that's a very telltale sign of someone who's got perfectionistic tendencies uh if something goes well you do something that's a success or you you get to the end of point of something really hard and you feel relief yeah you probably got a bit of perfectionism well i'm very glad that it went very well three million <laughs> views congratulations thank you that is incredible People need to hear this message. Thomas, so let's talk about procrastination, how it's connected and what should we do to deal with it? Yeah, perfectionism is very closely linked to procrastination. And there's a very good reason for that. So perfectionists have a very strong aversion to failure. 
failure is what peels back the veil i suppose on what's going on underneath the perfectionist person all, all underneath that impression management and those intense needs to hyper hyper functional and competent is somebody who worries a great deal about revealing flaws deficiencies chinks to to the world around us and so we're intently fearful of failure because failure failure exposes that defective self that deep down we know we uh, we we have um and so what does that mean well what that means is when we encounter challenge when we encounter situations where there's almost certainly going to be some failure involved perfectionistic people um, withhold themselves now we do we look at this in the lab and there's some really interesting experiments that we've done where we show if you put people in a lab and you tell them to do a task let's say a cycling task a certain amount cover a certain amount of distance a certain amount of minutes that you should comfortably do based on your fitness now if you tell people to go ahead and chase that goal when they try it for the first time they'll try so hard to reach it especially if you tell them it should be comfortable and then if you get to the end then you do something a bit naughty you say actually unfortunately no matter how well you did you failed you didn't quite make it and then you ask them to do it again something really interesting happens and this is what where the link comes back to procrastination because those who are low on the perfectionism spectrum don't really change their effort too much in fact if anything they they work slightly harder after the first failure but those who are high in the perfectionism spectrum do the opposite they withhold their effort because you can't fail at something that you didn't try at that intense worry about failure comes out in um, self-sabotaging behaviors you know they're so fearful of success that they'll self-sabotage the cha- uh, sorry fearful of failure they'll self-sabotage their chances of success because avoiding the failure is far more important than reaching the the end point and that comes out in all sorts of ways but pro- procrastination is so so closely linked because procrastination is really just an, an anxiety management technique for the perfectionist to try to soothe those feelings of guilt embarrassment and worry about having to start or create something new that's so big that's so incomprehensibly difficult that we just move ourselves away we pull ourselves away from the situation go on a netflix binge or what go through social media or whatever it might be just to take take away those feelings for that moment in time but of course we're just damaged by the um passage of time and our work it comes in late it's sloppy it's not as good enough standard or as good a standard as it could have been um and so that's why perfectionism is really closely linked to procrastination have you observed something where people who have who struggle from perfectionism they do they actually finally able to force themselves to do some of the work and fight the procrastination but they don't actually submit the work well this is the other problem um so perfectionists can start things but they find it really difficult to finish um and this comes back again to the fear of it not being good enough the fear of failure if they don't put it out there then there's no opportunity for people to tell them that it's bad and this is what they're so worried about so again it's self-sabotaging because they're so worried about people judging them badly or criticizing them that they won't put themselves in positions where they can be judged or criticized and that's exactly the same uh, process as procrastination even when perfectionists do get things started and they do perhaps get to a point where maybe most people would be happy with uh, they just can't let it go and i know this myself because having written a book not only did i find it so hard to get started but i also found it really tough to finish and by the end of it i had to i the finishing line was forced upon me by my editor and if I hadn't been I would have still been writing it now um because it's so so difficult to let go and of course you know I work on that all the time and I try you know I tried to remain in a, in a sense of serenity that actually you know I did accomplish something and I did get it out but nevertheless when you're in the middle of it and it's so so important and you know people are going to judge you and you know people are going to give you feedback you really want it to be as perfect it can be and that can really stop you um, finishing and moving on to the next thing which of course in the knowledge economy is such an important thing to be able to do and what is interesting is it's not as if we are often will think about it it will just happen somewhere at the back of our mind we don't know exactly why we are not finishing we've done 99 percent we don't know why, but we just something is stopping us from submitting that work, publishing that book, publishing that course, something. It's very, very interesting. Another element that I observed, I also seen it in myself, is that for me, for example, when it in terms of perfectionism, 
for me, it's about, I'm very hard on myself if I make a mistake. So I think it's not even as much about other people thinking something, but me thinking that I've made a mistake. Do you see it often? Um, yeah, this is this. Uh, so I see this a lot in my students, actually. Um, there's a fear that there's there's a there's a it's a rational fear in a way because the one if you if you want to discover a mistake in something, the best thing to do is send it off. <laughs> Because you will almost certainly identify something after it's gone in. So it's a rational fear built on experience, but it's also an irrational fear in the sense that those mistakes don't matter. You're the only one noticing them. Nobody else will notice them. And even if they do, they won't care. It's really a personal um, neurosis, I suppose, a, a, and a fear of, of putting substandard work out into the world and having that work being criticized or judged badly as i mentioned and those that's really you know if you want to get underneath this this aversion and it's, it's a perfection is just is a fee for progress it stops us moving forward it stops us continually putting stuff out there learning developing putting stuff out there learning developing which is so so important in uh, today's world of just creating just trying just putting something experimenting every not everything's going to go well in fact 90 percent of what we put out there is probably going to fail but the 10 percent, the stuff that gets through that's like gold dust because that's where the innovation is that's where the creativity is that's where the entrepreneurship is that's where the growth is so it's um it's a really difficult it's a really problematic way to move through life and it does hold us back Exactly. And people who are very driven, they often struggle with it. They str struggle with it. And in a way that makes us successful, but it also comes with a huge cost. Our health, relationships. Would you say, so So someone listening to this now and they're not 100% sure where they are on the spectrum. Is Are there certain things they can ask themselves to determine? Yeah, I mean, in my book, I have um, some questions that that um, people can play around with. I, I, it's not a diagnostic tool. I think it's really important people recognize that there are very there are diff different shades of perfectionism, different faces, and different combinations. And there's no real one size fits all. So, for instance, you know, we ask people, you know, I strive to be perfect. Is that something that you agree with a great deal or, or not a great deal? Uh, other people expect me to be perfect. Is that something you agree with? or not agree with um i expect other people to be perfect you know these are kind of different questions that we ask people to try and tap into those three dimensions of perfections and that i mentioned earlier and you can score higher or lower on one or the other or uh, low on all three or high on all three or somewhere in the middle on all three and, you, and every combination in between and, and everyone will have a sort of different constellation of perfectionistic tendencies and as i say we will have at least some level of perfection even if it's uh, very low but i think it's important to recognize in ourselves that if perfectionism is becoming an issue like to say if it's taking over our lives if it's stopping us moving forward it's blocking progress it's making us feel exhausted and sometimes quite cynical um if it's if it's intruding onto our social lives into our personal relationships if it's sacrifice if we're sacrificing our sleep and diet and exercise for just doing more 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 you know these are telltale signs that perfectionism is having an impact on your overall life and i think don't let that uh go <laughs> i think it's really important at that moment to reflect and think okay is this is this the best most healthy way to strive or are there healthier ways to go about doing this which will get just as much success but for less sacrifice thomas and have you implemented certain things that you do on a daily basis or weekly or monthly basis that helps you Keep some guardrails that protect you. I try all the time to be brave and push myself out of my comfort zone a little bit more every day. The thing that holds perfectionistic people back really is that if they're not going to be world champion at something, they find it really difficult to do it or at least put it out into the world. And that's certainly the case for me and everything that I do, it's got to be perfect or it's not going to happen at all. So it's really important to challenge that, challenge that perfectionism every day. So let's say in work, right? You Let's say, you know, you, you don't feel like you're a very good speaker and many people have this anxiety. Well, it's so, so important that you put yourself forward to do a talk. 
just do it do it tomorrow just say no okay on the next meeting i'll present the findings or i'll pitch the sales or i'll pitch the uh, product this time you know put yourself forward and be brave about that and go through the anxiety and the uncertainty and the worry that that's going to engender don't suppress those feelings just let them in they're very natural they're very humanizing and then go through with it and then ask yourself at the end reflect on that experience and was the outcome as catastrophic as perhaps you thought it would be. If you're not used to doing speaking, then maybe the talk's not going to be really, you know, an amazing, captivating speech. But what? But is that is that is that a bad thing? Uh, is there something that you can learn from that experience? And how would you go about doing it better next time? It's 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 really about taking small steps in the direction of of discomfort to become more comfortable with sharing yourself and your flaws and all the rest of it. Um, to the world so challenge your perfectionism every day and try to put yourself forward i think that's really important when it comes to procrastination i would say definitely give yourself time constraints uh, because if you don't do that you will sit and sit and sit and you'll start to wonder and your mind will go all sorts of different directions so one of the things that i try to do and say to my students all the time is give yourself half an hour you got 200 words half an hour go don't matter like what the quality is doesn't even matter if the content is going to make the end cut that's not that's not the point the point is to make sure that you get some stuff down you just kind of get some ideas on a paper and then take a break and then come back to it and give yourself another half an hour to refine to iterate to edit to kind of really distill those ideas in the direction that you want to take them and then again and then again and you can apply this to all sorts of activities if you're writing a report or you're doing a slide deck there are all sorts of ways you can use this technique, but it's so, so important that you give yourself that time constraint because otherwise your mind is is just going to uh, wander. And the third thing I think is really important to take into consideration is that when things do go wrong, and they will go wrong many, many times, as I say, failure is way more common than success, be kind to yourself. Don't go in on yourself. Always, always treat yourself like you would treat a friend if they'd made a mistake. Um tell yourself that there's a bigger picture look how far you've come look at what you've achieved just to get here it's just one setback and along a number of different setbacks what can i learn um and how can i move forward and and it's you know it's not an indictment on me it's just an in, you know the, uh, something happened that didn't go to plan didn't pay it pan out the way i hoped it would that's okay so those are the i think those are the three things on a daily basis that to try and bear in mind as you as you grapple your perfection very good advice and 30 minutes close to Pomodoro technique, 25 minutes works very well. And then reward yourself, give yourself a little reward in between, whatever you like. And it does work. It is very effective. So some introspection is necessary to escape this perfection trap. What are some of the common basic assumptions highly driven people need to confront so this so the so i think one of the big assumptions is that perfectionism is going to make us more successful i think we need to break through that straight away perfectionism perfectionism is going to is an unsustainable way to strive it's going to lead us to burnout and it's also going to create a lot of failure aversion which means we avoid and procrastinate none of those things are integral to high performance so i think that's the you know if there's if there's one myth i, I really would like to shatter through the work that i'm doing is this successful perfectionist myth because we see it all around us perfectionism is uh everywhere in society and and all we ever do is point to the people who have made it to the very top in business art sport and all the rest of it and we think okay well if they're perfectionistic then maybe it's a secret to success but what we don't see is the people who didn't make it who are also perfectionists who are struggling or through all sorts of um you know mental distress and worries about being good enough and not with the kind of you know the fortune 500 business uh, olympic medal or whatever to show for it so i think that that basic assumption of the successful perfectionist i think is one that we really really need to wrestle with um and i think the, the second one is if not perfection then what what should we be looking for and a lot of people say well shouldn't we be shooting for excellence well yes but also excellence is a high bar i think at, at root we have to acknowledge and understand that you know if if we look at the chances and the probabilities of making it to the very top, Nassim Talab did a really nice uh, experiment recently to show that if you want to make it to top in any discipline, he used the example of sport, uh, you need to be a six sigma individual, six standard deviations away from the mean, one in 1. 1.4 million. 
But you wouldn't think that, would you, when you look around you and see this celebration of these unicorn achievers all around us as if it's kind of normal, as if that's, you know, what we can achieve if we just put our mind to it. And I'm not saying we can't, by the way, it doesn't mean we shouldn't try, but I'm just saying it's hugely improbable. So even excellence is a high bar. What I'm saying is that 70% of us, fully 70% of us are going to fall somewhere around the mean, somewhere around average. And there really, really shouldn't be any shame in being average. It shouldn't be the dirty word that it is in society. And if we can understand that, if we can wrap our heads around that basic maths, then what that allows us to do is not worry so much about whether we're excelling or whether we're doing enough or whether we're good enough or, or whatever people are doing or however people are performing, but actually we can reflect on our own experiences and identify how we can uh, forge our own paths in life to find purpose and meaning and success and whatever it is that's important to us. And if we do make it to the very top, if our efforts and talents take us to an incredible level of achievement and that is amazing enjoy that you know savor it take it in but if we don't quite get there that's okay too that it's okay for us to be somewhere in and around everyone else is in and around and they're um they're really that that really shouldn't be the be all and end all of our existence and our identity um so i think that's the second thing that i would really like to impress on people that actually it doesn't have to be perfect it doesn't even have to be excellent it just has to be aligned with our values and that we find meaning purpose and some kind of you know significance in what we do some kind of contribution something that we're leaving uh, in the world i think that's so that's so so important so those are the two i think if you're asking me for the basic assumptions those are two that i think we need to rethink and I think for our listeners who are now thinking average, I'm not average, I'm never going to be average, and I want to contribute at a high level, it can be either driven by being successful and so on, or be, I want to contribute, I, I work so hard, I have all this knowledge and so on. And I think that what I can say from my side is if you have this intention to contribute at a higher level, you're already not average. If you are working just a little... Yeah. If, even if you just go to work and you take your job seriously and you do good work without perfectionism, without without killing yourself working weekends and nights, but if you just take it seriously during working hours or if you work for yourself and you take it seriously, you're already above average because we are all adults and we worked with many people in our lifetime and we have seen it over and over again how few people actually take the work seriously care about the clients and do the best they can in a situation. Yeah. And, this, and that perspective, I think is really important. And, and again, you know, finding meaning and purpose is, is it, it doesn't, you'll find that you you're successful just by, by the process of going to work day, day in, day in and finding that, uh, you know, that the passion, I suppose, the joy of just doing something that you love, like, it doesn't have to be outcome driven all the time. Some of the most successful people are just driven by passion and that, that, that they found their niche and they found their area and they've been able to um, do extremely well. But that doesn't, that doesn't, hasn't come from a kind of naked desire to get to the very top. It's come from a place of passion and purpose. And I think that is a, a really nice lesson that, that, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to be, uh, Steve Jobs, like a really intense perfectionistic person. Now he did make it to the top, great. But you know, Richard Branson is a counterpoint to um, uh, to Jobs in the sense that you know he, he has a much more um, laid back, I suppose you could say, contemplative um, and purpose driven way of uh, his entrepreneurship. And I think you know there, there's lessons to be learned from those two examples. That there's different ways to get there. And like you just said, if, if you can find if you can if you can find you know you can go to work with um a dedication a sense of enjoyment passion and and a, a sense of really just wanting to do a good job uh that you know it already elevates you so i think it's so important to bear that in mind in your book you shared a story written by a gothic writer edgar Allan Poe, about a painter who is driven to be perfect and to create this perfect painting and this leads to death of his wife because he asks her to paint her and as he was painting her week after week she was so exhausted and disappointed by a lack of attention from him because all his his attention was on making this painting perfect 
and he didn't notice that she died. Back in those days, in America, perfectionism was the stuff of popular Gothic horror and something people avoided and ridiculed. But we live now at a time where people admire perfectionism, which makes it even harder. So what would be your advice on how to deal with the external pressure that we are facing? Yeah, back in Jacksonian America, this was stuff of popular Gothic horror, you know, <laughs> this idea that lives lived pursuing perfection are, ult are ultimately empty, um, devoid of meaning or any purpose or any joy, and drain life, not just from ourselves, but from those around us. And that was the kind of lesson, I suppose, of those stories. And yet today, we have a very different perspective on perfectionism alive li lived scaling the dizzying heights of perfection in 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 that we see it as something that's positive desirable even and living inside this culture i think we're so wrapped up in its absurdities that we actually scarcely recognize this desire and drive to be perfect as an absurdity at all but you know when you look closer when you actually examine perfectionism what it looks like where it comes from how it impacts us not just our own lives but the lives of other people too we see a much different picture to the one that's portrayed on the billboards television screens and podcasts and movie theaters and social media and all the rest of it and that's a story of a lot of distress a lot of discomfort a lot of worry and rumination about how we're doing and how we're appearing relative to other people uh combined with uh, uh a very exhausting existence chasing something that's inherently impossible to attain um so i think again you know this is why i'm trying this is why i wrote the book if you want the basic answer is, is to try to raise people's awareness to this really um damaging personality trait and and to focus us or moot point us in a different direction um a, a more contented existence that's more purpose-driven where we can accept ourselves for who we are and what we are uh, and where we can meet the world more where it is rather than where we would want it to be and i think all those things are important lessons particularly right now in this world in this society in this culture that celebrates perfection and it's interesting because we are not completely naive we understand that there is a huge cost to pay if we do it but we still continue to drive toward the results in a way that is damaging to our health. And the reason I say we because of the audience that is listening to our podcast because of the way I am, we are all high performers in every role, in it, whether it is even back at university, straight A's. And we just want to do great work we want to push for results. We want to push our organization forward. We want to help our clients way beyond what they expect. Mm. But then it comes with a huge price and we need a better way to manage this. We still can do great work as you and I discussed, but you, you, you need to find a way not to do it at a huge cost to your health, your relationships, and just missing out on everything. I couldn't agree more. There is more to life than, uh, you know, numbers on the scoreboard. And that's so, so important to bear in mind. It doesn't mean you can't continue to strive and shoot for high standards. I, I, there's nothing wrong with high standards inherently. What's the, the problem is that perfectionism graphs high standards to insecurity and makes us feel worried about not meeting them all the time. That's not a healthy way um, to live. But of course, you know, if we're surrounded by people living like that, if we're in an echo chamber where everyone is shooting for perfection, of course, we're going to do it too. That's, you know, that's why we do it. We know it's a problem, but we do it anyway because everyone else is doing it. And so, yes, you know, there is a personal responsibility for us to take a step back and, and reframe and realize that actually there are healthier ways to strive. But also, I think as a society too, we need to have a conversation about what is um, a realistic expectation and, and 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 to what extent we're projecting onto people unrealistic ideals of things that just simply are very, very difficult for most people um, to attain. And uh, so I think it's two pronged really. Yes, individuals have responsibility, but society also projects these, these perfect ideals all the time. And organizations as well. 
the way we treat our team. Yeah, organizations too. I mean, look, you know, perfectionism is very good for organizations. It's very good for the economy generally, right? It, it, um, it creates a lot of shareholder value, you could argue, and it grows, it, more broadly, it grows GDP. But is it good for us? That's the question. Is it, is it, you know, are we benefiting? Um, and if you make it to the very top, then there's an argument that you are, yes, but most people don't. Most people are striving relentlessly and not getting the rewards that perhaps they deserve. And the productivity that they're producing is is siphoned upwards for their organizations. And I think there's a, there's a very legitimate question as to what extent, you know, our hard work is met with fair rewards and perhaps at the top it is, but perhaps lower down it isn't. And uh, again, that goes back to society and how we want to structure society and whether we reward the efforts of everybody. And um, and again, you know, this is this is the, where perfectionism comes into the picture because if we're working really hard but we don't feel we're getting anywhere, we don't feel like we're being rewarded, then yes, that's great for the firms and organizations that we work for, but it's not necessarily so great psychologically uh, for us. So it's, I think really, if you want to get a nub of it, it's about reflection. It's about asking ourselves, you know, what are we doing this for? Um, and is it healthy? And I think often you'll find that when you reflect on your perfectionism, that it isn't the most optimal way to strive. And, and actually, you know, we talk about productivity, but there's a lot of research to suggest that, that if we can be conscientious, meticulous, diligent, those, those are far more healthy ways to strive than to be perfect and not only healthy, but also they'll, they'll help us to be more productive too. Thomas, and you know what we've done with our discussion? We made it very hard for our listeners who currently may be between jobs to answer a question, what is your weakness? Because the <laughs> most common answer is I am somewhat of a perfectionist. Yep, that is a very common answer. I'm sure a lot of your listeners will have maybe used that answer themselves or heard that answer in interviews. Um, I, I think it, that also speaks to the, the culture piece to this. You know, that's the, really a question about what's a socially desirable weakness. Like, what is a weakness that we think the interviewer is going to like to hear? And of course, so we inevitably want to show them that, you know, yeah, we know perfectionism has this baggage, but look at how willing I am to self-sacrifice in, in order to get the returns for your firm or your company. And, you know, it's kind of almost a celebration of the willingness to go above and above and beyond. And I think, it is an overused cliche. I think a lot of interviewers will have, will see past it, um, but I think it's also quite revealing about our, to, uh, our willingness to embrace um, perfectionism as a as a kind of veil, a, a kind of emblem of success, I suppose, um, in modern society. And I'm sure this this discussion will resonate with a lot of people listening. For those of our listeners who now think that. Yes, I understand all the costs involved, but it's a necessary evil. What would you tell them? Well, I'd say, look, you know, we have so much data now. We've got decades and decades of data that shows perfectionism is strongly correlated, particularly socially prescribed perfectionism. So that's the perfection that comes from other people in the outside world. A very strong link to very negative psychological outcomes, things like depression, anxiety, low mood, rumination, brooding, worry about other people, self-presentational concerns, hyper-competitive streak. Uh, I could go on, hopelessness, helplessness. I could go on. There's so many things, negative things it's correlated with. But on the flip side, there's an argument to say we know that, right? It wouldn't be our favorite flaw without those things. But we think it makes us more successful. But here's the curious thing. When you look at the data and look at all the data, particularly in the workplace, there is no correlation between perfection and performance whatsoever. None. And that's that's because two things and things we've kind of topics we've covered. Uh, burnout. It's an unsustainable way to strive, right? It might get quick gains, but it isn't going to work over the long run. Perfectionistic people are prone to burnout, and that can have a massive impact, negative impact on our productivity. But similarly, perfectionists find challenging situations really difficult. So they withhold themselves at the first moment of difficulty. Well, that's also not conducive to success either, because particularly in the knowledge economy, where just in time innovation is such a crucial part of the um, business cycle, where we need to be pushing things out all the time, trying new things, failing, trying new things, failing, trying new things, failing. And then that one thing suddenly pops and it's like, there it is. That's the, that's the solution. And that's what's going to make the money. Well, perfectionists just can't work in this environment because of those four or five failures that led to that success are so difficult for the perfectionists that they'll just withhold themselves 
and they won't put this they won't put themselves out there they won't put their ideas out there for fear that they're going to be rejected or criticized so it's not even conducive to, to the types of performance that the modern economy demands so you have a situation where yes you've got a lot of struggle and strife but for no apparent gain so my message would be well why are we why are we striving for this why are we shooting for this ideal when there are far healthier ways for us to approach our working life that um allow for a lot more contemplation a lot more relaxation a lot of rejuvenating activities but also um a lot of um goal directed effort but that doesn't come with the hang-ups that come with perfectionism so we just got to find better ways to do it and perfectionism isn't isn't the right direction and in addition to this would you say that we should go as far as considering it a fool's errand irrational maybe that will be helpful for some of our listeners to look well, at it that way it is because perfection is an inherently impossible outcome. You know, you could strive for things to be just so imperfect all the time, then we're never going to reach an endpoint because there's no there's no destination there. What's perfect? Well, you know, perfect. Can, this nothing is ever perfect. So whatever we produce could always be improved, and this is the problem. Perfectionism is is like chasing to, to the bottom of a bottomless pit. It's like trying to chase the horizon. The closer we get, the further it, it, it moves from our vantage point. You know, there is no end point to lives spent chasing perfection because perfection is an inherently imposs- impossible outcome. So I think that's really important to bear in to bear in mind. And that's why perfectionists can't find lasting satisfaction from success. That's why they're relieved when they don't fail. Uh, because they're chasing something that they're never going to, they're never going to achieve. And and I think, as I say. It's so, so important that we do have endpoints, that we do have goals, that we do have moments in our life where we can accept and meditate and realize that actually that was good enough. That actually, you know, I'm happy with where I am. I've reached a point in my life where the success that I'm enjoying is is enough for me. That it's making me happy. It's giving me a standard of life that affords me the things I want and need. And beyond that, I don't need any more. This is where I want to be. There's a sort of serenity and contentment in in being able to to land the plane and not constantly chase a nirvana. Um, and I think that's you know that's hugely important when it comes to approaching our goals, our life, our working, you know, our professional lives, our personal lives, and everything. Um, so that would that would be what I'd say to that. Well said, Thomas. What would be to start wrapping it all up? What would you say people need to do, our listeners need to do on Monday morning at 8 a.m. differently? I would never tell anyone to do anything differently. Everybody has um, their own way of approaching their lives. But I couldn't I can say that there are things to bear in mind. And if you are feeling like you ha- have perfectionistic tendencies, if you're thinking that it's something that's impacting on your professional life and your personal life, or, or both then it's really really important to be preemptive to recognize it and to challenge it uh, and, and challenge it in a couple of ways one get yourself out there be vulnerable take chances uh, put yourself into situations that you might not feel necessarily very comfortable and just just sit with that discomfort at least for a little while that's really that's really helpful really humanizing so you know on monday morning maybe put your hand up to do a pitch or a presentation or uh, um or, you know, uh, chair in all hands or whatever it might be. Just put yourself out there to do things that you wouldn't ordinarily be comfortable doing because that's so, so important. It teaches us a lot of things. But in those moments of discomfort, it teaches us that the outcomes, by the way, of whatever going wrong aren't as catastrophic as they think they are. But also all that impression management, all that worry, all that withholding of ourselves is really just fear. And if we can push past that fear, um, we become stronger, we become more comfortable in that discomfort. And we find we're more productive. We grow, we develop, we learn. And those are really, really important things. Um, secondly, I would say, as I mentioned earlier, self-compassion is really important. So make sure that whenever things don't go wrong, as they will many times, be kind to yourself. And third, just get things done. Done is way better than being perfect. So as I mentioned, try to be very strict with yourself about time. Uh, don't allow yourself, your mind to wander. Give yourself short, sharp, 
um, periods where you of intense productivity, then reward yourself, then go again. This is a way of chunking your effort that help you push past procrastination, worry about how it looks or, or whether it's going to be appraised positively. Um, and for me, you know, those are the, I guess those have been the three most helpful things for me. There are many other things that I, I talk about in my book, but those are the most, I think, most powerful in terms of breaking through perfection. Thank you, Thomas. And the last question from me is, and this is not connected to the topic, but it's my favorite question to ask. In the last few years, what were two, three aha moments, realizations, insights, something you something you learned or realized that really changed the way you look at life, or the way you look at business? Good question. I can tell you one thing. When I was younger, I was a very good football player, soccer player for people listening in the US. And I was through the academy system to a very high level. Um, but unfortunately, I hit my sort of early to mid teens and I stopped maturing. I stopped developing. My muscles stopped growing. Um, I didn't uh, I didn't have a spurt like everyone else. Um, I didn't basically hit puberty. And I was I was what uh, bio, uh, maturational scholars call an extreme late developer. That's to say that essentially I didn't really mature until I was well into my teens and actually into my early 20s. And then when I got cut from the academies because I wasn't as strong, I wasn't as fast, I wasn't as agile as the other kids, that was in, I, what I remember, that was very, very, very challenging for a young person because it's really hard to see that as anything other than your own fault. And it's really difficult to cope with that disappointment and and feeling that um, of rejection because you had your whole hopes pinned on being this amazing Premier League soccer star and you were told all through your childhood that you had really good technical ability and you're going to make it and then suddenly you just stopped growing. And that was catastrophic for a young person. It was it had a really significant impact on my life. And then I look back at that experience when I was writing my book in my 30s and it made me realize something really, really important about life in general. There was nothing I could have done to stop that happening. I was born with that late maturity in my bones, in my genes. That was just fate. And I was never going to make it. And fate is nothing personal. Sometimes there are things that we cannot control. Sometimes things are going to happen to us that really we can't perfect, that we can't shape, we can't change. Heartbreak, grief things coming out the blue, a global pandemic is going to hit us, screw everything up. These are things that we cannot do anything about. And instead of trying to happen constantly in the world and think that everything was, is in our orbit to control, that we are the author of our own destiny, to actually understand that, to recognize that and realize that we can have goals and aspirations and we can try to meet them and we can set ourselves on the course to meet them, but we can know that the journey is not going to be linear and that there are going to be setbacks there are going to be things coming out of the blue that we can't control there are going to be peaks there are going to be troughs there's going to be moments when we grow there's going to be moments when we stand still there's going to be moments of regression where we realize we didn't know as much as we thought we did and all of this is fine and normal and natural part of being a human being who is imperfect and fallible and exhaustible and for me that really was the moment of epiphany um where i began to approach my life in a very different way um and let life in a lot more let experiences in let setbacks in let failures in and allow them to just sit next to me comfortably or in you know not necessarily always comfortably but certainly sit next to me and allow them to wash over me and, and remind me really that that is just what it means to be a human being so that was if you're asking me for a big epiphany moment it was really reflecting on those formative experiences of setback and failure um that have, have helped me learn a lot about myself subsequently but also a lot about perfectionism more generally such a beautiful answer and i'm sorry that you went through it i went through something similar i used to be a concert pianist and one of the reasons i stopped is because my finger started hurting a lot in this area and probably was my fault because i was a perfectionist and i was practicing way too much probably although it is expected to practice that much but maybe i was doing something wrong my, my hands probably my hands probably were not relaxed enough there was too much tension too much tension yeah. so i totally understand what you went through thank you so much for sharing it so eloquently could be another ted talk <laughs> could be another TED talk. <laughs> no worries it's good to have it's good to um chat these things through i um i hope it was useful for your listeners
It was incredibly useful. Thomas, so where can our listeners find you? Anything you want to share? Anything you wish I asked you? I didn't. The floor is yours. Share anything you would like. Uh, no, uh, your listeners can find me on Google if you type in Thomas Curran. Uh, C-A-A-N is my surname. Uh, you can also find the book if you Google The Perfection Trap, which is out on uh, August the 8th. So I think it should be out when this podcast goes live. Um yeah and please do i would love to hear from readers so if you read the book you enjoyed it you found it interesting do do feel free to get in touch through my website or uh on any of the social media channels and i'd love to know what you think thank you thomas thanks everyone again for tuning in our guest today has been thomas curran last name is c-u-r-r-a-n check out his new book it is called the perfection trap a very good name And if you want to strengthen your strategy skills, get the overall approach used in well-managed strategy studies. It is a one-pager, very useful. Go to firmsconsulting.com forward slash overall approach. Take care, and I look forward to see you all next time. Thomas, thank you again. Thank you.